Hello and welcome to another Meet the Creators um, from our brilliant supporters, Afters, Film Vic, the amazing Film Vic, and of course, Acme, who are flogging away in the background here to bring this to us today. Before we get underway, though, I would like to um, pay the, my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're all on today. And in my case, I'm on the Great Ocean Road, and therefore, I acknowledge the people of Eastern Ma and the Wadawurrung people. And I pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. And of course, to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are watching here today. Welcome and thank you. Um, Okay, we're doing something really exciting today, determined directors, because we all know how few feature films get made in this country every year. So what better time to uh, actually take a look at those that, that managed to get their films up despite every obstacle this side of the black stumps. So let's welcome our four guests today, Adam Elliott, uh, Academy Award winner, hello, um, Sarah Lamberg, who just churns out so many amazing films by, I think she says, blood and sweat and friends with them um, who are very supportive. Um, Aaron Wilson, the boy from the bush, who's just got his first feature film out or second feature film out at the moment. And Logan Mutcher, who's also working on features, but also has actually got a terrific TikTok um, film up at the series up at the moment and it just demonstrates how many different ways there are to actually get to make your feature film so welcome everybody we're going to start I'm going to start with you Sarah what on earth drives you and I want to know from everybody what keeps you all going in terms of making these films well I sometimes I feel like it's pure madness um but most of the time it's the people around me and the kind of the feedback that I get from doing my work and just feeling like I'm doing something that I might be a little bit good at sometimes and just feeling worthwhile as a human being as a result. <laughs> good motivation. Okay, Adam, God knows, I think you said 12 years since your last feature, is that right? Yeah, well, look, I... Um, I when I was at film school in 1996 at the VCA, I stupidly came up with this concept to make a trilogy of trilogies, which is three short shorts, three long shorts and three features, never thinking I'd you know, get even half of those done. Uh, but I've, yes, I've done, I've done three of the short shorts, I've done two of the long shorts and I've done one feature and I'm just starting my next feature. Um, and then I, I'm almost 50 as well, and I think I've come to the conclusion I, I can't do anything else. Uh, I did want to be a vet when I was at high school, but I, my marks were dreadful. I, I still want to be a cake decorator, so if this next film flops, um, cake decorating might be the next career move. Oh, a good move, I reckon. Um, Logan, what about you? I'm going to go with madness, I think. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I think... Uh, I couldn't think of doing anything else, really. I think I think Aaron as well uh, studied engineering, and I, I don't know. I just it just wasn't for me, and I just always like storytelling. I tried a few different things, like writing and you know studio arts, and I think film was just the thing that found me. Didn't really have a choice in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you study it afters? Was that you, or was yes, that did, Alan? Yeah. I mean, Alan. It was Aaron. It was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Cool, me? Aaron. No, no, that was Logan who studied it after. Yeah, just yep. getting it clear here. Brain's a bit slow this morning. Okay, well, I mean, what about you, Aaron? What drives you? Because I've got such a fascinating story about your film taking 10 years to complete. Everything everyone said, but with a touch of, I guess, uh, stubbornness in that's probably my country upbringing. Um, it, it's really, I guess, personally, it's about my, my desire to, to comment on my place in the world, like where we are as Australians in our region and, and how that's an important part of our history and where we are and where we're going. That kind of finds its way into my films. Um, but I also really, really love connecting with audiences, speaking with people once I've created a film and I'm traveling with it, be it here or in Australia, um, around the world, I really love that connection with audiences and that feeds back into the next films that I make. 
And of course, you're a boy from the bush. And so you're very keen to get regional Australia up there as well. Just tell me briefly about that. Yeah, I think it's just, again, it's a personal thing, me wanting to see my place in the world where I come from. But that also is the world that I grew up in and the importance of that world. I think I find that the older I get, I'm looking back on where I've come from, my upbringing, more with a nostalgic lens, perhaps a longing for it, for being connected to that world. The idea that you don't really leave that world, it stays with you, you carry a part of it with you. Um, I've lived a lot around Southeast Asia, traveled a lot in our region. So the further I go from Australia, the more I feel pulled back to where I come from. So I think there's that desire to really speak about that longing and that connection um, and the people in that world, which I find very special, um, it's, it's talking about them in my work. Um, uh, um, Adam, where, what's the sort of worldview that you're trying to get across, which also is obviously a major part of your motivation, as, as Aaron was just talking about? Yeah, look, I, when I was at uh, the VCA and we all had to make our student films, um, I did a very personal film about my uncle, uh, all in plasticine, very, uh, no camera moves, it was all narrated. And I thought I was just making a very local film, a very, you know, Australian flavoured film. But then when I started entering film festivals, I, I realised I'd accidentally made something universal. Uh, with an archetype and I, I you know I was only 25 at the time and I then realized well actually if, if, if I'm going to make more films they have they have to be universal and they, they definitely have to celebrate Australian uh, stories and characters but um, if I can create them in a way that people in Sweden and Japan and uh, Iran can understand then I've got a I've got more of a chance to reach a broader broader audience and be allowed to keep making films. So that I think it's always been number one for me is to, is to create a story that is universal, but also um, has a, a long shelf life, a, a timelessness to us, which is why all my films are set in the, in the past. You, you never see a mobile phone or, uh, you know, they're all sort of in the 70s or 80s vaguely. Um, and I think animation lends itself to that as well, that it does seem to have a, a, a sort of timelessness to it. So I think they're the, the main sort of things that um, I try and uh, aim for with each short on feature, yeah. Sarah, what about you? Same question. What's your world view that you're trying to share with the world? I was really lucky to, to travel a lot when I was a child. Like my, my family lived very simply, but we did travel. Um, so I've, I've been able to see people from all over the world since I was a very small child. So, I, and, and I think that that's, that's really influenced who I am as a person and my kind of understanding how similar and different people are at the same time all over the world. And, and I guess um, that's just informed me as a human being in, in believing in things like equality and everyone everyone being valuable and and I've also had some tragic um dramatic life experiences as well as a lot of joy like I feel like in experience I've lived a really rich life even if in material it hasn't been rich at all so I feel like I, I just want to bring those experiences that I've, I've been able to and I've been privileged to have into my work and and those values that um have been installed in me as a result of that life. Thanks. Logan, same question for you. And then we're going to move into some case studies. Um, I suppose, I don't know. I think I feel I don't have a fully articulated worldview yet to kind of uh, give to people. I kind of started in documentary, I think, because after my first year of film school, I made some terrible short fiction works and realised I didn't have much to say. So I kind of got into documentary for a while, which kind of allowed me to engage with different communities and different stories that were around the world. Um, I think now kind of moving into fiction and drama, I'm kind of looking at it more as a process, I suppose, orientated thing. I kind of use, there's something that's kind of in my mind, like Scattered was about grief and it was kind of a process for me to kind of think about that and deal with that. So I think I kind of learn what I'm, what the contents and what the, you know, the shows I'm making are about as I make them. Yeah, I don't kind of go out with a set fixed worldview. I kind of learn along the way. 
Cool. All right. Let's sort of let's spend a bit of time digging in as to how you get films made and and what you're trying to achieve with them. Adam, I'm going to start with you, um, and I, I, I'm going to play the, a little clip, a cut down clip of Mary and Max, because I don't believe there's a person on the planet who hasn't seen some of your work. But just in case, let's have a wee look at this clip, please, Simon. If you could play, that'd be great. Mary Dinkle's eyes were the colour of muddy puddles. Her only friends were the noblest from her favourite cartoon. She wished she had some friends. Mary had an idea. Dear Mr. Harrowit, I am eight years old. I have a wish to call Ethel. <laughs> it would be great if you could write back and be my friend. Dear Mary, thank you for the letter. I have never met anyone from Australia. I share my home with a fish, a parakeet, an invisible friend called Mr. Ravioli. People often confuse me. I have trouble understanding them. Maybe this is why I don't have any friends. Mary and Max. Oh, I love that. Every time I watch that film, I would so cute <laughs> but I want to know about the process because you know it's a year as you said um but can you just explain what stop motion is for people who don't know sure well look um it's very simple it's it's like all other forms of animation in that we have to create 24 25 movements per second to create the illusion of movement and um, so if a character waves their hands and you see that for one second we have to move it 25 times to create that one second. So on average, we we do about five seconds per day per animator. Um, I'm actually not a very good animator. I've, I've never done a walk cycle. I'm terrible at lip sync and I've never enjoyed animating. I, I much prefer writing and directing and assisting editing and all the other, all the other stages of making a feature. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, I think really for me, I mean, just watching that trailer, it reminded me with a feature you don't get to, I mean, one of the reasons I became an anim animator is because I'm a megalomaniac and a control freak and I, I, I love doing as much as I possibly can. But with a feature, you realise you can't do it all yourself. We worked out if I had have done Mary Max by myself, it would have taken 235 years. Uh, so, um, so I had to get people to help me. And even with the trailer, I mean... Most feature, feature directors don't have much of a say in the trailer. I, I don't even know the person who put that trailer together. I don't particularly like that trailer. I find it a bit, a bit too uh, saccharine or something. Um, but, yeah, I think that it's particularly the difference between shorts and features is there's, you need more uh, minions to come and help you uh, make them. But... Um, I mean, I've only made one feature and, and that was a, a long time ago and I worry I've forgotten how to make features and uh, I think I keep going back to, to the story and the screenplay because we all know that that's paramount and that's the most important part of the whole process. Um, and I've, I've spent, I'm, I'm a very slow writer, which is another reason it's taken a while to get this film up. It's taken five years to write. I do many, many drafts. Um, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with getting the perfect word and um, I probably over polish. But um, yeah, for me, it, it's always been about the, the script and the screenplay and the story. And as I said, the animation to me is secondary. And I'm very glad to hand that part of the process over to other people because I'm, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> How many people on your team? Like it's huge, um, isn't it? Oh, well, Mary and Max, it was just like a, you know, a, a live action feature film. We had, you know, a big lighting department. We had teams of um, set builders and prop makers. Um, you know, I think there was 40 people just doing all the sound because just like the animation, we have to create mm. all the sound from scratch. Uh, we had 2,000 props, 200 characters, 200 sets, all handmade. There's... There's no computer-generated imagery. We certainly use uh, visual effects to clean the images up at the end in post. But it is, it's a traditional 
art form done in a very traditional manner. Um, but is, is alive and well. Stop motion is going through a bit of a renaissance. You know, the Wes Andersons and the Tim Burton are all having a go at it. Guillermo del Toro, he's, do, he's doing his version of Pinocchio at the moment for Netflix, completely stop motion. So it's certainly not a dying art form like I was told back in 1996 when all my... My uh, friends at the VCA were all pursuing computer animation and I was the odd one out playing with blobs of clay in the corner. So, yes, it's alive and well. It's going for renaissance. Yeah. I'd love this. Simon, can you pop up while we keep talking? Um, we got a steal from your latest film, which you're working on at the moment, Memoir of a Snail, because, I mean, it's the most beautiful image it's just so cute can you just tell me a little bit about the story uh yeah well, all, all my films are based on real people mary max is based on my real pen friend who's who's in new york who's still alive and we still write letters to each other um harvey crumpet was based on an old cub scout leader who leader i had who had a steel plate in his head so they're all my stories are based on real people they're not documentaries but they're, they're certainly um embellishments of true events and so this film is about my mother who's a reformed hoarder uh there's a lot of myself in this film i'm i've been for a long time interested in why people collect and when when does a collection become a hoard and and why why do we uh, place emotional attachments on all the things around us so i'm always obsessed i mean i'm i'm a reformed hoarder myself i'm i'm more of a minimalist now um so this film is um it's a comedy tragedy it's it's like all my other films it's a I mean, my films are very formulaic, I've realised. Uh, <laughs> you know, they all have these uh, underdog archetypal characters who um, have bittersweet lives and there's a lot of dark humour. Um, but they are, yeah, they're all based based on truth. And, and this one is set in Canberra. I've got a lot of relatives oh. in Canberra. So it's it's the, the, the tagline is... Uh, uh, the memoir of a lonely uh, hoarder who collects ornamental snails in Canberra in the 1970s. So that's about That's it. a very good log line. <laughs> hey, how do you manage to get these made and filmed? Because, I mean, you know, your budget that you raised, I think I you said, I think, $7 million, Is that right? This or one's something... uh, seven. Um, Mary Max was eight million. Oh, look, it's it. People say, "Oh, stop motion must be so tedious," and I always say, "No, no, it, it financing is tedious, um, and it's getting harder." As we all know, uh, back in when we made Mary and Max, it was pre-rebate. We got most of the money from the FFC and so a little bit of private investment. But now, as you all know, you watch the credits to a feature film, and there's so many logos and executive producers and we have eight entities on this one. So it's a mix of Film Victoria, Screen Australia, MIF Premier Fund, Madman. Uh, we have a French financier, uh, uh, an English uh, sales agent, French sales agent. I'm leaving somebody else out. I mean, so there's all these different entities and you all have to agree. And, and the, the production investment agreement is such a thick document. And even that takes up to 12 weeks for it to get formalised and agreed on. So yeah, financing is is excruciating. Tough. Oh, it's horrendous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Aaron, I'm going to come to you because financing um, for your films, the ones that we're going to talk about with Little Tornadoes, that was um, mainly getting your mates to <laughs> help out, wasn't it? Tell us about, because that was a trilogy and this is the second part of the trilogy, correct? Yeah, it's in my head. I have, I've had this trilogy for many years the first part being canopy my first feature which we finished in 2013 and and this film being the middle component kind of commenting on rural life i guess the legacy of trauma across generations in a regional australian world so this is little tornadoes is, is the second component in that in that trilogy why don't we just have a quick look at the trailer because it's actually just sort of come out with meth and it's, I mean, it's a happening thing. So let's have a look at the trailer, please, Simon. I told you that, I told you that. 
Tanto tempo fa era un paese diverso. Well, I think what men mistake for happiness was in fact uh, resignation and impatience. Come here. You home? And now women are beginning to feel that patience is not the answer. I don't think she's coming back this time. Daddy, where have you been? How could you not want to escape? You keep your mouth shut, okay? I finish here at three. Start today, yes? Right on. This is Maria. She's going to be here after school from now on. Jack, do you cook? Ma i cimiteri australiani mi scioccavano. Tutte quelle erbacce, tutta quella dimenticanza. Chi sta a vita? Chi sta a felicità? Un'ora per abbracciarsi e poi morire. The kids, they're asking after you. Ask Bobby Jim. Era anche un sogno per me di scappare. Difficile parlare di certe cose, ma non ha trovato coraggio. Well, I've had the privilege of actually watching that film, and it's a bloody ripper. But what fascinates me about this story, and I know that people are going to find it really interesting, is that film isn't really what was shot 10 years ago. It's taken you 10 years to go from the shoot to deliver that film. In brief, can you explain the process of that? What took 10 years and it was amazing. In brief, huh? Um, uh, <laughs> we haven't got 10 years, darling. I'm so sorry. We just I don't want to explain it. Look, you mentioned the financing before and that was, that's probably the most stressful period for me, raising finance. And it wasn't just raising finance before we shot this. We shot the most, the, the, the principal photography or a good chunk of it 10 years ago. We basically over the last few years have been shooting bits and bits and I've been raising money in the last two years to finish the film. So we were kind of raising money in post-production as we were doing pickups. Uh, and then of course a pandemic hits and make things so much easier for us. Um, but raising finance through a pandemic to shoot pickups uh, and then to, sh to, to complete our post-production. And in that post-production, like you say, we still, did a lot of creating and shaping of the film to make it different to what we originally intended the film to be, but, but still the idea of the story, um, the vision's still being carried forward. I mean, I think like I did some um, sessions with Aaron and also Cindy, who was the editor on it. And I think what was interesting about it is that you cut it like twice and then mm. had this sort of flash of inspiration that a voiceover would be a really great device to help with the storytelling. And you managed to persuade um, Christos Stoikas to come on board and sort of do that later. That's a very unusual process, isn't it? Yeah, but then making films is unusual, I guess. Um, there's no right way to make a film. It's just whatever feels right to you. Um, and it was sometime early last year, we, we realised, Cindy, my editor and I, realised that a voiceover would really help with grounding the emotional core of the film a bit more and just giving us more access to the the inner world of the characters so um i didn't want to write that i knew i wasn't going to be doing it justice if i wrote a voiceover but i wanted to collaborate with someone that understood the vulnerability of these characters and the intimacy uh, in the story so well christos was my first choice uh we just sent it to him and thought well, we'll see if he responds to it and fingers crossed um 
And a few days later, he got back and, and loved the film and said he wanted to be involved. So that was a very, very exciting moment for me, um, not just to have Christos on board, but also to be able to collaborate with him in an intense way, which the next four or five months pretty much became. I think it's such a beautiful film and I just love it. So the minute you can get to see it, just get out there and see it. I don't know when that's going to be, but patience will pay off, I promise. It's great. Hey, Sarah, let's talk to you about your amazing film career. You were a director at your first film, short film at like 14. You were first AD at 17 and you started directing eight years ago. And in a minute, we're going to play. In fact, Let's play the clip from your latest film, which is about to be launched post-COVID in Cannes. So should we watch that first and then talk a little bit about how you work? Lovely. You don't mean that. You have no idea. I need to see you again. No. Why? Can I call you? Sam? I'm your mother. Wow, that looks amazing. Tell us a little bit about that story before we talk more generally about how you managed to get your films up. Yeah, so Westermark Effect uh, is my second feature film, as, as you mentioned. And uh, yeah, it tells the story of, um, of an adopted boy and mother that after 20 years of being separated, re-meet each other and fall romantically in love. And um, I remember you were explaining that in a lot of your work, you do a lot of improvisation. Was that one of the films that you use improvisation in or was that not? One of them? Not a lot. This one was um, definitely fully scripted. Um, what I do always encourage in my actors is, is just saying things the way they would say it. So I'm never going to be forcing my actors to say exactly what's on the page. So from that point of view, yeah, lip syncing rather than delivering exactly what's on the page. Because for me, I'm just the a, a strong believer in authenticity and people saying things the way they would say them. So from that point of view, yes, but no, there wasn't really a lot of improvisation used uh, in creating this film. This was scripted. And it's about to as be um, to be shown in Khan next year with all going well. How, yeah. like, how do you feel when one of your features heads up there? I mean, it's a very exciting moment, I would have thought. Oh, yeah, it's, I mean, that was... My, my personal um, pandemic disappointment so far has been 2020 when we had this scheduled for, for Can then and we had about 10 people going. Um, a lot of my cast and crew were equally excited as I was to be able to uh, world premiere our work there. But uh, yeah, for understandable reasons that didn't go ahead and, and we're hoping for next year. Um, I know, I mean, because there's so few feature films or um, actually funded in Australia. So how do you raise funds for making films? And I remember you saying to me that one of the things that you do is you work as a medical actor to, to help with the funding. I don't even know what that is. But also what other, like, how do you raise funds for it? Well, it's an interesting thing when you say that so and so many films get funded because I don't think my film would even come under that category. <laughs> um, it hasn't really received, um, none of my work, work to date has received any funding from, from the kind of the funding bodies. Um, the, the money that goes into them is from crowdfunding um, and rest of it is basically just sweat equity, people volunteering their time and that's basically the only way I can at this stage make my films. 
and it's very unfortunate of course I'd rather be in a position where I could be paying people but it's just it's not, it's not happening at the moment um so yeah I'm just very fortunate to have a lot of people that believe in my work and that want to work with me and that want to donate their time to to making my films happen I know that there's at least one of your films available on, is it Amazon? I can't, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. But can you yeah, tell us where we can see it? First first feature, Innuendo. Um, yeah, in Australia, you can watch it through um, Umbrella Entertainment. Uh, they're my distributor here. So they've got it on Vimeo, iTunes, Google Play, uh, various different platforms. Um, in US and UK, it's on Amazon, yes. Um, and through the rest of the world, Playwood Entertainment, that's my um, international sales agent. They have it um, on their Playwood Entertainment YouTube channel, I believe. So do you think your biggest audiences are outside of Australia as a result of it being on, you know, Amazon outside? Or, or how, how do your audiences sort of weigh up? Uh, we were actually really lucky here locally as, as well. Um, I had a Cinema Nova release for it and it's been on Channel 9. Um, so there was, yeah, and, and quite a few local festivals. And But I was also lucky to travel to various different international festivals. It's impossible, I feel like, for me to say where the bigger audience is, but certainly we had a very, very um, large local support, which was great. It's terrific. I mean, I so admire your dedication. I, I mean, I've watched some of your work and it is amazing. It's really strikingly different. And I just go full power. You know, <laughs> you've got the absolute determination. I bloody loved it. You epitomise what we're talking about today. Um, just people um, watching will notice that we're not actually taking questions during this um, actual um, streaming today. Because what we're going to do in about... 10 minutes is that we're going to put up the actual zoom room address and invite people that are watching to come into the zoom room and ask questions directly now that part of the um of the stream won't be broadcast later because we don't have won't have permissions for people to um to appear but we're going to actually do that in about 10 minutes so um stand by to be able to enter the zoom room but in the meantime logan like I'm hanging out to talk to you because I bloody love Scattered and I can't wait to talk about all the rest of it as well. So, Simon, let's play a little bit of, let's play the first episode of Scattered, which is on TikTok, and we'll go from there. It. Ooh, what time is it? Mm. I am never drinking again. <gasps> My shoes. Mm. Classic. Where's Will? He's, um... He's... Will's body is gone, but his spirit lives in our memories forever. Mm. Um, it's great. I've watched quite a few and I just think they're amazing. But tell it like it's the story of, no, you tell it. You're, yeah. you're the author. You don't need me telling um, it. Yeah, so it's just three three friends who's uh, one of their closest friends kind of dies, you know, very suddenly and they go to his funeral and it's a bit drab and doesn't celebrate who he is, you know, as a queer person. And so they uh, take the urn for one last night out to kind of take it to all his favourite places and give him the send-off he deserves. But then they wake up the next morning, uh, terrible hangovers and without the urn. And so they've got to retrace their steps and figure out uh, where they lost the urn to give it back to the parents in time to scatter him. <laughs> yeah, so how, how did that come about and, and what was it like delivering to TikTok? So it came about, um, I came up with the idea of my uh, co-writer, one of my co-writers, uh, Kate Darrigan, for, um, there was a pitch for Screen Australia through, for a Snapchat series. And we weren't successful with that, but we were kind of encouraged to apply again um, for TikTok, just as through a general kind of application. Um, and the producers who worked with had previously done their own kind of funded, you know, self-funded show through TikTok. 
And then um, Screen Australia was just keen to try the platform and do something funded for it. So we were the first funded, I think, I'm not sure anywhere in the world, the first funded uh, series for TikTok. Um, yeah, so it just all happened quite quickly and organically. Um, but making something for TikTok was very different, obviously, for the obvious reasons that it's a vertical series, um, which, you know, drove my cinematographer mad for a long time. He was just like, let's just shoot it, you know, normal landscape and then we can like do a proper release after we can then cut, uh, cut out the vertical just for this and you know we kind of talked about and looked about and kind of then you know obviously retrained our brains to think about it how we can actually tell a story through vertical filmmaking and use it to our advantage um, and the other main difference was the obviously the short lengths at the time TikTok is only doing minute long episodes so we had to con try and create a kind of a series arc over 38 episodes we had in the end and then to still try and contain self-contained episodes for every minute because people come in at all various times, obviously, if you're kind of scrolling through and to try and provide hooks. So it's, it was very, it was difficult to write because everything had to be quite short and snappy and self-contained, but still form part of a larger story. And how does it sort of, because I know that you're also writing feature films and you've got um, ambitions for feature films and you've, you've already made one feature doc didn't you was that yeah about, i made a feature was, documentary before i realized how hard it was to make features so i'm kind of glad i did that before i learned too much about filmmaking and how hard it is um you know i was young kind of out you know didn't realize and went overseas and made a documentary about uh, gay rights in eastern europe in particular in belarus and then um yeah i've been trying to get back to the feature world ever since <laughs> Well, I mean, and that was one hell of a difficult thing to make. I mean, it was about Gay Pride Week, wasn't it? Which is filmed illegally in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so the first, I went back a second year to go film the ones in, in Moscow, but that year, the one, the, the feature centres around Belarus's first uh, Gay Pride March. And I think, you know, being young and a bit naive and not really, you know, worried about your own personal safety, um, you're kind of just like, yeah, I can just buy a camera and go off and travel Eastern Europe for nine months and make a film. And it, it, it all turned out well. <laughs> yeah, but now, you know, obviously I'd never do something like that, be so reckless again, but it was great to have that experience. So what sort of feature films have you got on the, on, in the pipeline? So I'm trying to write my first narrative feature. I'm kind of obviously new to fiction writing, you know, obviously spent a lot of time doing documentaries and slowly edging my way to this. Been working in advertising as well, which is kind of, you know, Helps with TikTok, to TikTok as well, but um, so I'm writing a feature about uh, teens, about youth trying to navigate, you know, the world that's going to be changed by climate change, um, and trying to look at it from a less pessimistic viewpoint than I suppose a lot of end of the world kind of films are these days, which is you know everybody's quite selfish and in for itself. And I'm trying to show a different side that people can come together in times of crisis instead of uh, pulling apart. And we're in that on the writing blocks at the moment, is it? Or is it in close yeah, to Yeah, no, funding? so writing, so the good thing about COVID is just having a lot of time to write and no excuses not to write, um, which has been really helpful. So I kind of was in a couple uh, writing programs, one of which with Film Victoria early this year, which is great, which kind of gave me a good uh, start to it. But yeah, just being plotting, outlining, and uh, I think I've been, you know, learning, you know, like, as Adam says, taking a long time to, you know, five years to write something. It's I've kind of, you know, wrap my head around this is not just something you have an idea and you smash it out in a you know a few weeks it's 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 been about a good eight months or something just to i suppose lock the outline and the premise of the film which i've kind of you know so now i'm kind of actually starting the writing part but i just wanted to make sure i had all the building blocks there in the right place before i got too far because you talked about your advertising work Aaron, you do advertising too, don't you, as well? Both of, it's interesting you both have, you were going to be electrical engineers, now you're doing, you know, very similar paths. What's it like, uh, what can you take out of your advertising work and bring into your work as a feature film director? For both of you, that question, really. Okay, well, I think I find that a lot of, I kind of, you know, direct some ads every now and again, but I spend a lot of time as a director's assistant, which is great because I work with these amazing directors around the world and help them develop their ideas. And um, for me, that's been an invaluable experience because I think in terms of directors, we don't usually get to hang out with each other that much um, in a normal, you know, kind of, kind of the film world. So advertising, as working as assistant means I get to work with amazing directors who are so much more experienced and have all made features and, you know, get that insight on a regular basis. And so that's what I get out of it. And I think from actually creating, when I do ads, it's, you know, obviously try and do a bit of story, but it's more about the craft. And I think having access to those bigger budgets and those tools that I probably am not that privileged to get 
in my normal kind of uh, filmmaking career and having those kind of crews is it's been great to kind of prep me for hopefully what's coming. Working as a DA is really good too would you say so just just working with someone else but also on on the pitch documents which so often don't pan out you might maybe do 10 pitches and two of them pay off as commercials but it puts you in really good stead for doing funding applications or submissions in the future um, because you've got to get the imagery right and um, just to even source images I'm pretty terrible at it but to have a good DA that can actually source images it's a really great skill to lay out your ideas clearly in a way that agencies are going to go yep I get it and they hire you is a, is a real skill so um, I really love doing it and I love working with with DAs because again it's back to what Logan said you're, you're actually working with other directors and bouncing ideas off each other um, which is rare but it, it leads to a point where if you're developing film ideas down the track instead of just writing it out you might put, lay it up into a, a treatment with some imagery which means when you're showing that to producers or potential funding bodies it gives them a clear picture of what's in your head so yeah, I think um, doing ads gives you obviously some great money and connection to crew to be able to work more regularly than you would with film, but um, it gives you these other skills uh, along the way. I'm um, actually gonna get Tara at Acme to put up the Zoom address in the chat in a moment, because I do wanna to talk to you all in a minute about you know how you like the career things that at moments that have led to where you are and your careers generally. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do now is say thank you so much again to our sponsors because we're actually going to say goodbye to most of the YouTube people now. And um, but you're not allowed to go, even though, like, I'm going to thank you, the panellists as well. Just don't go away because we've still got questions to ask. So thanks a lot, everybody. And we'll just see you on the other side. Please join us in the Zoom room. It'd be lovely to hear from you, your questions yourselves. <laughs>